does all oh, right yay all right hello everybody and welcome to yet another episode of witches and wine i am your hostess lola stardust and this is the show where we talk about witchy stuff and we drink wine clink, clink and drink. drink clink and drink oberon all right as you can see we have a wonderful guest but before we get to this awesome guest i'm going to turn this over Oh, I got to do a disclaimer. Yeah. I got to do my disclaimer. Got it. We have had complaints before that people just don't understand the fact that we get a little tipsy sometimes. And I want to remind people that the show is called Witches and Wine, where we partake in wine. If you do not like seeing people have a good time with wine, there's this wonderful thing in the corner. It's an X. You can X out and not watch us. Woohoo! Okay. So let me turn this over to my partner in crime, my husband. Silenus Stardust, would you tell us about the wine tonight? Yeah. Hi, hi guys. Um, we're doing a little daytime show for us. Yeah. So we went to a lighter white. Um, I chose what's called Praia. It's a Vino Verde out of Portugal. A Vino Verdes are the white wine that come from Portugal. They're nice and crisp and refreshing. Uh, excellent daytime camping lake wine. Um, this one particularly has notes of citrus and peach. Yes. Uh, runs about 10 to 15 bucks a bottle. Um, if you just want something light and fruity, easy drinking, not sweet or dry, this is a, a good style of wine for you to check out. It's good summer wine. Yep. It's beautiful for sunny weather, and it's very, very good. And then our special guest is drinking something himself. Yeah, what are you drinking, Oberon? Uh, Thomas Henry Rosé from California. Oh, there and we go. I can't give you all the details, but it is a very nice, light, sweet, fruity kind of a wine and very appropriate for um, this time of year. And yeah. All good. Excellent. Well, we are so excited about this guest. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm having like a fangirl moment. Um, I have talked to Oberon before, though, but it's still his presence is is very, very strong. If you don't know in the witch world who Oberon is, I suggest move from underneath the rock that you have been sleeping <laughs> under, because this is one of the original yep. OGs. This is he's amazing. The, the American pioneer, the kind of the, the California pioneer. Yes, of the witchcraft movement, and uh, he's known as the Wizard Oz. He's uh, started a has a school. Uh, we're going to talk about his school, the church, his new vision, twenty twenty vision uh, thing. Thank you. Oh, it's Oberon Zell. Welcome, Oberon. Hey, glad to be here, guys. All right. So excited. So first of all, um, what I want to start with is you moved recently from California to, are you in Tennessee now? Yes, I'm in Tennessee presently. Outside and of Nashville. How, how long were you, you lived in California for a very, very long time, didn't you? Yes, I did. Let me see. How long was it? I um, moved out there in 76 and um, up there until just a couple of years ago. When wow. I want to talk about. So I've been kind of on the road for the last couple of years, traveling yeah. around the country and the whole Western Hemisphere, for that matter, really. And, awesome. you, and you ended up in Tennessee. Can you tell us what brought you to Tennessee? Well, um, a, a number of things, although um, I'm actually contemplating um, uh, moving again uh, back to, uh, in fact, your neighborhood. I'm looking at moving back to Seattle area. Uh, oh, Wow. wow. Uh, in another month from now, actually. Oh, wow. Wow, that's crazy. We'll, we'll be a couple hundred miles away. We're here in Spokane. We're in Spokane, Washington, but we have family in Seattle, and we'll, we'll be close by. That would be really good. We'll feel your presence as you cross into the Washington state border. <laughs> it's going to be another journey, a, med, a, a significant journey. But uh, what brought me here was, um, well, many things, really. In my travels, I was looking for two things, really, a home and someone to share it with. And both of those were available here, made available to me in very nice ways. But that was before the uh, present pandemic hit. And yeah. so things have changed since then, you know. Yeah. And um, a part of it had been that uh, Nashville is a very central to all the pagan festivals in the East. It's a day's drive to Puff, yeah. Yeah. To, to Starwood, to Three Gates, to... Um, all of these things that are all right in the neighborhood. I can drive to Atlanta. I can drive to St. Louis. I can, and that was a good appeal because previously, when I was on the West Coast, flying me across the country to these was just a huge endeavor and expensive yeah. and time-consuming and and challenging. So I figured, well, this will make life a lot easier because I have so many 
contacts and many out people here I love. I mean, I'm I'm very close to the people at Serenarid and the farm and uh, and a whole community in Nashville. Yeah. And all that stuff, you know, it's all good. Yeah. But that was before the pandemic, and um, but that's not really the main thing. I have received an incredible offer um, to move back to the West Coast, and um, kind of irresistible. And I I don't want to go into too much detail right now. Yeah. But I, I, when it all falls into place, but it's um, it was presented to me as an offer I couldn't refuse, and it and it definitely is. So oh. it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting new phase. And you know, my life has been a series of incarnations in one body. You know, I've had many, many different amazing lives in different places, in different communities. The only real constant for most of my life was Morning Glory. Yep. You know, we were together for 40 years. Oh, and, yeah. and then she died. And it's uh, coming up on the sixth anniversary of her death. Wow. In another um, week or so, on the 14th of this month, will be six years yeah so since then i've um i've kind of been adrift you know yeah um, i i lived my entire life uh, in partnership um you know from the time i left home i got married my first year of college and Whoa. have been married uh all my life i know how to do that i'm a good partner a good husband you know yeah i, I relate to that i've never tried to live life as a single person yeah so, it's been strange, you know. <laughs> well, you know, that would be strange, but I think that only you could take it as a way to, well, let's go on walkabout. Let's go find what I need to find. And um, you have so many adventures while you do it. And I love it because it doesn't matter what age we are. We have so much life to live. And, it, and there's so many adventures to get into. And that's what I've always loved about you. You are ageless to me. Yeah. You're just ageless, you know. And... I think that's great. You, you have such a youthful energy about you, and you have so much, just that radiance of joy, and I, I want to go find the next adventure. Yes. And yes. Well, that's, that's true. That is true. Yeah. yeah. And so, I've had amazing adventures. I've, I've just, every now and then, you know, I kind of look back over my life, and man, I have had a really great life. Yeah. <laughs> a totally oh. amazing it must be nice to appreciate instead of dwell. Yeah. So many people get caught up in the negative and forget to appreciate what life has given us. You have well, no regrets. I think people miss a major point that is, is kind of hard to assimilate, uh, although I, um, I think it's becoming more and more a dominant paradigm. And that is the idea that, that our, we are in a simulation. We are in an existence that is, um, there, there may be many other simulations. This is like being in a second life. You know, we've got our world that we're in, and it's very full and complete. But we are avatars. You know, we are inhabiting avatars, and our actual reality is, you know, is somewhere out there. And we we extend ourselves and put ourselves into this reality the same way we do when we're playing a game. But if we look at all this as a great game, you know, that is somehow, you know, created by cosmic universal consciousness or the quantum field, if you want to do it scientifically. Yeah. All, all the same. All yeah. the same. Yep. Um, then it puts all different cast on it. You know, you look at things as an adventure, which is why we have all these stories. We love stories. Yeah. We love games. We are obsessed with it. This is our uniquely human thing. And yeah. uh, to participate in this, in what by all appearances um, can only be called real life, whatever that means. Yeah. You know, we're, we're in Wonderland, you know. We're in um, uh, Neverland. We're in Fantasia. We're in all those kind of a things. Oh. <laughs> us, exactly. We're in all yeah. those places. Yeah. It, it seems like the whole magic is just science unexplained. Yes. Falls into that category. Well, I hear so many people relating magic and quantum physics and all that, and I and I love that because it gives us not only the possibility to have so many different experiences and so many magical things, but it I think it brings it to a level that maybe people who don't understand what we do they might be able to understand it. You can talk to the logical, the people who have the logical scientific brain and say it's really not that different. We, from we, what, we, you know. we can prove what we know and experience. And it's, until you've experienced it, you can't explain it truly because yeah. you don't get the feeling. Yep, yep. Right. Well, these days, um, with the um, extension of quantum physics, which has actually been around for a century, but only really getting the serious attention it deserves recently, um, 
it all does make sense. We do yeah. have a science and theory behind it. And magic, in the way we define it in my community, is probability enhancement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and quantum physics is all about probability. There is no solid reality. There is no predetermination. I recently, I've been binge watching various amazing TV shows, and these are constant recurrent themes. You know, one that I recently watched um, was called uh, Devs, D-E-V-S. Oh, yes. Yes, I've, see, I've not seen it, but I've seen the commercials for that. The fundamental premise, though, was determinism, that if you can know the exact position of every single, everything in the universe, you know, then, then you can predict everything. And it was all based on having this vast computer, quantum computer that could do that. Yeah. Well, that's a fundamental fallacy in that, you know, the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty is that you can never know both the position and motion of any object at all, ever. Yes. So it is completely wide open, and and we are constantly creating this reality by our own consciousness and the choices that we make, and that's really the probability factor. So, yeah. we're, we're, if we shift the probabilities in all of our magical work and the grimoires and the tables of correspondence are all about piling up the probabilities on this end of the scale where yeah. we want this to happen. That's that's what this stuff is all about. All the setting up exercises and the colors and the candles and the yep. objects. It's all about that, you know. Yep. And, and the whole concept of threefold and yes, all that, yeah. That all of that, every aspect of it, and so the laws of quantum physics, as they're being articulated, are in fact indistinguishable from the traditional laws of magic. Yeah. Of which, of course, quantum entanglement is the most interesting one because that's that that's you know straight out uh, law of association and contagion and all that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm totally digging it. I'm totally loving this stuff. I talk about this stuff. I live in it. You know, I make my decisions and my uh, drink. To this. Click and drink to that. Yes, I. I this is. I could just pick your brain for hours and hours. <laughs> I well, have a theory that I like to share with people because right. I always feel like we are. Sometimes memories, of like of the of, of there's an outer being, and we are their memories. We are the the. It's hard to explain, but like there is something bigger than us, and everything that we do on this earth, on this planet, we are we are living in their dream or their memories or their you know. And so we can almost do anything like you can in a dream. Well, it, it's like you a, know, it's like a massive past life transgression of, of one of one master being. Yes. Yes, and it's. I feel like that sometimes. Well, I, I think that's true. I really do. I've been um, uh, rereading re recently the Tao of Physics, which is all about that same sort of thing—a complete yeah. equation of mysticism with quantum physics—and it all works. It all fits together like that. And we are um, in that. And if and the thing about you touched on earlier, we can talk about anything we want to. So, yeah. and in psychedelics. Um, you know, really good heavy duty acid trip will take you there. Oh, yes, it'll, it does. It'll pull, it'll pull you out of this avatar just enough to look around and see what else there is. There's yes. a there's a fascinating little TV animated show that I've um, I watched recently. It's only like you know 14 short 22 minute episodes or something called um, um, the Midnight Gospel. I've and never heard of it. If you well, I highly recommend it. It's okay. all about sort of stuff and it's done by the um the guy who, who who creates it uh has has a blog that he's been doing for years yeah and he's taken the interviews with people that he's done for his blog and then animated them into amazing sequences sort of like drunk histories does you know yes so yes we're seeing this bizarre and, and every episode begins with him choosing a different virtual reality to go into to interview people oh in. wow and okay. they are amazing. They're mind-boggling things because the actual people interviewed are very, um, very trippy people, very yeah. heavy-focused people. And the final episode is an interview with his mom about life and death as she was dying of cancer. Oh, wow. It's very deep and very profound and totally psychedelic animation. I mean, if the show is obviously meant to be watched while you were tripping balls, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you know? I just... Clink and drink to the fact that Oberon Zell just said tripping balls on our show. I, that, that's <laughs> <laughs> I think we can say anything, so, you know, there we are. 
No, you, you are you are talking to very we we are very pro LSD pro you, you hallucinogenic. Go back and watch our previous episode. It's like episode twenty something on hallucinogens. We did please. a show on witches and wine on hallucinogens and ritual and stuff like that. And we were um we were on shrooms so, when we were yeah, doing it. So. Else, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a there's a delightful show that I've enjoyed called um uh what is it now? Just a minute now. It's it's about a um oh come on. It's it's about a uh, marijuana dispensary in Southern California is the theme of it, and it's uh, come oh, on. Is it got uh, Kathy Bates? Yes, Kathy yes, Bates. Yes, I can't remember the name of the show, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I can't remember the name of the show. Well, it's um, meant to be watched while you're tripping, that's for sure. Well, yeah. not tripping, uh, high. Hi, yeah. yeah. It so features so. as part of it, these people doing a blog thing just like this while they're yeah. completely... Completely out of their minds. You know? <laughs> yeah. well, that's kind of, I mean, you know, we have episodes on Witches and Wine where we are blotto. Like, yes. we are just, but you know what? The more blottoed we get, the, the more, more fun things come out. And, you know, and, and that's why we did a disclaimer because some people found that offensive that a high priest and a high priestess would let themselves, let ourselves get drunk and talk to people but really but know. it's free you know uh, it, what is it i mean hail dionysus you know wine is about <laughs> truth yeah. wine is what does it say in vino veritas yeah. or yeah, vino veritas in truth is wine in truth is wine and and it's that way with a lot of things you know um it's not for everybody hallucinogenics and nope. those kind of things are not for everybody and we respect that but there are people who understand that you know what you come to your truth you you find your god or you find your whatever you've been looking for, you know, and it, and it's hard to explain to people who've never done it. And the only thing I can tell them is, well, you know, come do it with us and we'll show you. <laughs> it, it, but everything is always about personal choice that we, there is no, yeah. you must do this because you know what? It takes away the free will aspect that yes. is necessary that you experience with these. So it's consent, we, yeah. you know, consent, but yeah. Well, we're, we're talking shamanism here. Really. Yes. We're, yes. We're going to shamanism. The, of of all the magics, you know, wizardry, witchcraft, all that stuff has its roots in ancient shamanism. Yeah. You know, and and you talk about the hunter gatherer societies and the typical vision that people have is the men are going out there hunting a mammoth or something, and the women are going out with the kids and they're rooting around to see what's what's good to eat right now. But people often miss the fact that among the gatherer side of it are the village shaman who are out yeah. there looking for you know, things and, and, and trying, oh, whatever happens when I eat this mushroom? Whoa, yes, you know? yes. Yep. And we needed those people to to kind of be our pioneers of figuring out, the, hey. The original this, guinea pigs. Yeah, the, they were the <laughs> guinea pigs, yeah. <laughs> I really love this. this. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. So um, what I also want to talk about, um, first of all, the, uh, your uh, 2020 vision. That you're what, doing. What is this? What is this? Um, I will. I want to put the website. We'll put it in our description at the end. Oh, but what please. is the website? It's it's called Twenty Twenty Vision Awake. Twenty Twenty Vision Awake. Okay. Dot com. Yeah. Dot com. Okay. Yeah. And what is this? What is this website? I know you brought it up <laughs> on Bella's show that we did with you. Can you I, go into detail about what this is? Absolutely. Some long time ago, decades ago, I discovered um, a cycle that I don't think anybody else had noticed before, although now many people have, and that's a 60-year cycle of cultural renaissances. And it can be traced like clockwork back to the Italian Renaissance of the 1480s. For, and each of these has a name, they're, they're well known, the Florentine Renaissance of 1480s, the, the Reformation of the 1540s, the um, Golden uh, Age or English Renaissance of the 1600s, mm -hmm. the Scientific Revolution of the 1660s, yeah. The, um, the Great Awakening of the 1720s, the um, Age of Reason and the French and American Revolutions of the 1780s, yeah. the, the uh, Transcendental Awakening of the um, 1840s, the Golden Dawn of the turn yep. of the century, yep. the New Age of the 1960s. Each of these has this kind of a flamboyant title for them, you know, like that. Do we have a title? Our desire, do we have a title? We do. The Awakening. The way, that's what you do. Okay. They, well, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. The awakening. And so now um, 
2020 brings us to the first year, the dawn of that. In each of these eras, each of them has been totally transformative, culturally transformative in various ways. Usually something starts at the beginning of the decade that kind of kicks it off. In the 1960s, for example, the pill was invented in 1961. Yeah. And right through that, um, LSD and psychedelics came into the picture. And all this came in right at the beginning of that that transformed the era in a way nobody could have predicted beforehand. Yeah. Nobody could have imagined the world um, of, of what it would be like when people were tripping on LSD before yeah. that. For example, yeah. you just couldn't. You know, these are mysteries. We talked about the mysteries uh, at the Spring Mysteries. Yes. You know, and a mystery is something that you can't talk about, not that you're forbidden to, but you can only experience it. You cannot explain about sex or an acid trip to somebody who's never had one. You can talk about it all day, and you still have to actually experience it. Yep. To do it. Are yep. you experienced? You know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, we are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly we are. And a good part of our life, I think, is magical people. And what gives us that excitement and joy that you comment about is the idea of all these amazing new experiences and things that we can experience. Well, the 2020s um, is now upon us, and the absolutely unpredictable event is kicking it off, which is a global pandemic. Now, we've had global pandemics before. Yep. We've had the, the AIDS pandemic was huge. Millions of people died. The SARS, the swine flu, the, the great pande flu pandemic of 1918. Yeah. Yeah. Enormous, but none of these have sent people into seclusion the way this one has done. Yeah. We're, we're experiencing like that old sci-fi movie from 1956, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Yes, yeah. absolutely. This is the year the Earth Stood Still. Yeah. And it's astonishing. Everybody all over the world has simultaneously gone into seclusion and to, to contemplate whatever they choose yeah. to contemplate. Pollution levels have dropped precipitously. I uh, love that. I've heard of level 6% droppage they're expecting this year. Yeah. 6%. That's a huge that's number. That's huge. And, and I look at it as but this is another correction by Mother Nature. She's undefeated. Yep. And she, yep. Exactly. And if we look at viruses as as Gaia's um, antibodies to respond to um, uh, to diseases that she, she she gets, such as this cancer of the systems that humanity has produced to a great extent, and other things like that. This is what happens in any animal population too. Is at a certain point, if things get out of control, their population explodes. Like um, like with rabbits, there's a disease that hits rabbits, and their population gets too big, and then yeah. they all die. Yeah. You know. So if we look at it as Gaia's response to humanity, but it isn't like more people are not dying at this time. That's what we we see in the news and reports. But if you put that against the number of people who are not dying in traffic accidents and in industrial accidents mm -hmm. and many other sorts of things that people have, I suspect that we will find that the overall mortality rate is actually less right now. Mm -hmm. People are going voluntarily into this kind of a um, vision quest, a, a retreat, a, a like a, having a global time of fasting and retreat that you do before any great magical working. You kind of, you know, you take that little retreat. Well, yeah. the whole world is doing that right yeah. now. So if we as magical people can understand and work with this, yeah. we can utilize this thing to then formulate an incredible working to be done as a culmination of this, a, a working for um, global awakening. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm envisioning. Getting rid of the me society and going back to the we, we society. society. Yeah, it is. This is about we and not about me. And there have been some wonderful little YouTube videos that have been coming out along these lines in all these TV shows that I've been talking about that are coming out about this stuff. This has become a new paradigm that is emerging. Yeah. A, a paradigm of uh, consciousness, of global awakening, of, of that we are living in a simulated reality that we can yeah. alter if yeah. we choose to. There are many things, and these are all emerging in the new mythos that we're seeing happening right before our very eyes, you know? Well, isn't this showing what how we've moved into the age of Aquarius, where we left the age of man and we moved on to the age of Aquarius? This is the enlightenment, the, you call it the awakening. The awakening, yeah. The, the, we're, we're, we're looking beyond the physical and knowing there's something greater that we can connect to and work with. Yeah. Precisely. And everybody is getting that. 
I can have this conversation anywhere in the world. Yeah. It's about anybody in the world, worldwide magical community. You know, it's it's astonishing. It's it's a wonder to see. And um, the thing is that it's like like the entire pagan movement. None of this is going on because some single individual visionary or prophet is promoting their own particular vision. This is something that is emerging collectively from the greater collective unconscious of yeah. Gaia that yeah. is, I feel, um, moving ever closer to a global awakening of the entire planetary organism herself, you know, of which we are all part yes. and of which we all participate. I was talking to someone and I can't remember who it was. It was just recently um, and they had said that people say, oh, the earth is, is going to destroy itself. It's going to die. No, the earth always survives. She corrects. The, she corrects. She right. always survives. So this is not, not her saying, um, that's it, I'm done. This is her saying, no, all right, no. we got we to gotta fix some stuff. And she doesn't want to destroy us. She no. wants us to learn. She wants us to better ourselves. And this is a perfect opportunity mm -hmm. Because people now that I never knew in a million years, like our friend Cindy and Lauren, yeah. they're gardening now. These are people who have black thumbs. I have a black thumb, and I'm excited about gardening. Well, it's, it's bringing a, us it, back to our roots. Yeah. It, it's reconnecting with, like you said, with Gaia, with Mother Earth, getting yes. their, their hands dirty again, not relying upon everyone else to provide. Yep. Being a I community know. again. It's amazing. I've, I've thought a lot over um, in... Oh, in the last 50 or so years, um, a, a recurrent theme in science fiction has been the idea that the only thing that would bring humanity together would be an alien invasion. Yeah. You know? yeah. And there are many different versions of that, the, the Independence Day, the Watchmen, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, the point is that there has to be some kind of a global crisis that affects everybody in order to create a unification of humanity. And yeah. we've been divided. The biggest problem that we've had has been our division, our divisiveness, our alienation from each other and from nature, you know, men and women, humanity and nature, everything like that. We've, we've separated this out. Well, the word religion means relinking. And what religion is supposed to do is to heal all that alienation, separation, bring it together. And Joseph Campbell, in his uh, last book, The Power of Myth, made a statement that we are ready now for a new myth, one that is about everybody, that we're all included, not about how our people are better than those people. Yeah. You know, it's what it's always been before. You know, it's always been, well, we're the chosen people. We're the master race. We're the whatever. And everybody else are like, forget them, you know? Yeah, yeah. We can't do that anymore. We no, really we can't. And we're don't mixing it up. We're mixing up the nations, the languages, the races, the peoples. And as we do so, out of this is emerging a new collective identity in which we're coming to understand that we are all children of the same mother. Yes. We are all we are all one. Yes. Yeah. And don't you think that this clink and drink clink and drink to to, drink to that. Right. We are all part of the one. We are Gaia's children. Exactly. We are Gaia's children. We're all part of the one. And she does love us. She does and love us. A mother loves all her children. Yes, she does. She yes. has to discipline them though. I mean being a parent yes. myself, I love my children, but there's days when it's like Oh my gosh, you know, like I love you, but I could really yeah. beat you down right now. <laughs> I think for a long time, guy has been saying, you know, if you all don't behave yourself, don't make me come back there. Yeah, don't, don't make me, yeah. Maybe don't, take make me, don't make me take off my shoe. Don't make me take off my shoe. <laughs> exactly. And finally, it's gotten to that point. She says, all right, time out, go to your room. Yep. And, and I'll clean up the mess, and you just, you know, go to your room. Stay, you're grounded, yeah. Grounded. Don't you think yeah, but it, then you, and, then you see, and then you see the rebellious kids that refuse to listen to any rule or any acceptance of... Uh, well, that's what I was going to say. I think this pandemic is going to bring out our true colors. And I think even... And I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'm very optimistic about things. I even view those who are brought out that where it brings out the true colors and they're not that pretty, those people we know... And but I think that's needed. I think we always need the antagonist. I think that we can't. We have to have the light and the dark. The balance. We have to have that balance. And so we need those people to push us to even do more of the right thing. Does well, that yeah. make sense? You know, the, the the you know the the deer and the rabbits need the wolves to yes to, to keep pushing their evolution to get faster yes. and better and smarter. Yes. You know, this is a requirement of the system. You know. It is. It is. 
And so I think it's, I think this is a, a wonderful way to look at, you know, what are, what are we going to do and how are we going to make our mark? Because we are going to be talking about this in years to come telling grandchildren and, you know, and saying, and this is what we did as a community. I want to be able to tell my grandchildren, we pulled together and we started growing our food again. And we started being um, humane to the stranger, to the elderly, to the, the homeless person, to the, you know, buying groceries just for one person can do so much good for someone. And oh, yeah. you know, that's important that we do I that. Saw, I saw a wonderful little YouTube video, very short and beautiful one, that was a father telling a bedtime story to his kid. And the story was about the great realization, and that was the book that he was reading from. And it was all done in poetry and beautifully moving, with great imagery. And it was about this event. You know, yeah. where we came from and what we went through and how everything has changed afterwards. And it's a beautiful story. I posted it, uh, the link to it on my Facebook page. Um, oh. So you should check it out. I don't remember the name of it, but it was a beautiful, moving thing all about this, really. Yes. And you know? this brings out the true beauty in people. And, and I think that's what we need to focus on because there are always going to be. He works in the public, and so he has a lot of stories about people who just don't treat each other well because of. But I think it's because of fear and it's control. And well, they feel that their control, they, they have no control over it. And people, that brings out a very... The greatest motivator of all time is fear. Yes. 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 And uh, I've often say all the time that we have to make our decisions based on what we hope, not what we fear. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, there's a book, a series of books by Terry Goodkin called The Sword of Truth. And the first one is called The Wizard's First Rule. And it is, they're, they're not rules like the like we think of the regular rules. There are rules of wizardry, but this isn't really one of them. But the first one is people are stupid. They will believe anything that they either fear to be so or hope to be so. Yeah. But people don't operate out of their hopes. They operate out of their fears. They do. Mm -hmm. yep. And we, as magical people, I, I feel that we both have and must operate out of our hopes. Yes. You know, not out of our fears. I think, I think pagans and witches, though, are... We know we're, we're, we're in our training, we are trained to not fear death. Right. Um, we are trained that that fear, any kind of fear we have can be flipped and can be turned and turned it's an into, opportunity. it's an opportunity. It's not exactly. a hindrance. Well, and, in, in Chinese, the word um, crisis actually translates as opportunity. Oh, wow. I, I, know, I didn't amazing. know that. Well, look yeah. at that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's what this is. Well, because because <coughs> in, in our craft, we look at it as the shadow work is how we truly find the balance that is out there because we all have stuff that we can improve upon to make us better. Yeah. And it's, it's always a reminder that we're not perfect. No. Exactly. Well, when you look at a game process, there are several things. What is the goal of the game? And people generally simply think simply that it's to win. But that's not ultimately the goal. The goal is to move to the next level. Yes. That's the real goal. You know, winning is, all, is, 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 is minor. And people who are operating on that level think it's all about power. Whoever gains the most power, the most money wins the game. But that's totally pointless when the game is over, you know. Yeah, the and it's your destiny. To, is to uh, transform yourself through the game to, and move up to the next level. Yeah, it's your destination. It's not the destination itself. It's how you, what happens on the way to that destination. Exactly. That is where the, that's where the true learning and the and and everything that we need to know as humans and growing you you yes you see your destination but that's that's not it's, it's not the end game that's it, not it, no that's not what the it's void, about the void is what's important yeah the end game is the result yes absolutely yeah. absolutely and see the nice thing about this this conversation we're having the same conversation is going on everywhere mm -hmm. all over the place especially in the magical community but also more and more outside of it there are uh, right now, according to statistics, paganism is the second largest religion in America. And our, our present numbers are close to four million, according to the surveys and statistics, yes. which all say they're probably underestimating and under, yes. under yeah. closer to eight to ten. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and we are also and have been for decades the fastest growing religious movement. Yep. As well, and it's not just in America, which is what most of the surveys are about. It's happening all over the world. Europe, it, South America, yeah, Australia, exactly. Indigenous yeah. peoples, as well as European-based peoples, are beginning to reclaim their.
their heritage mm -hmm. and their old religion, whatever that may be for them, respectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it will look at China, how for so long they went away from their history, and now they're trying to re grasp it all and get it back after selling it for so many years. Yeah. Because they want to go back to their roots. Yep. And, well, and accept their heritage. And the government is actually fighting this tooth and nails. Just recently, our Gray School of Wizardry has been um, uh, cut off in China. Our students over there, and we have lots of students in China, now no longer have access to the Internet uh, to be able to participate. Oh. Well, this is a good transition. Will you talk about your school? Since yeah. you said you have students in China, where all, I mean, he tells like you yeah. have students everywhere. When did you start your school, and and how did that become? And then when did you come? You did you start it before the whole Second Life thing, and then bring it to Second Life? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> well, actually, it began um, with the Harry Potter phenomenon when that first came out in the late nineties. I think yeah. it was eight or ninety nine. The first movie came out. Yeah. And Morning and I were asked to come to a Jewish shul in San Francisco that offered the opening night of the first movie to talk to the students, teachers, and parents about real magic and real wizard because they were worried. What is this going to be showing people? Now, is, it, is this a more Kabbalistic Jewish practice or was it? No, it was just a, a normal Jewish shul for, for huh? grade school and high school kids. But they all wanted to see the movie, so they felt that it would be a good idea to bring in a real witch and wizard. Yeah. Couple, and we were the only ones that they could find, because there just weren't a whole lot of witch and wizard couples running around loose at that time. Exactly, well, yeah. They found us and got a hold of us. They invited us to come, and we came in full regalia and oh, brought okay. a bunch of props and did a great little talk and, and did a few little subtle kind of magical things that kind of blew people's mind away because we weren't really saying, now we're going to do a trick. We just, you know, suddenly worked some things into our conversation. Yeah. And people loved it. And they had a nice little spaghetti dinner. And then afterwards, we all went out to the opening night of the movie where the shul had reserved the entire balcony of the theater. Oh, nice. Awesome. But we didn't have time to change. We showed up in our pointy hats and robes. <clears throat> and like whole, everyone else was thinking. It was full of pointy hats and robes. Yeah. And this tall. Yeah. That was, was amazing. And so we're sitting up there in the balcony enjoying the movie, which was really fun, and looking down over all these kids. And we had this vision. They said, you know, unlike all of the other movies about a magical world, like, you know, Narnia or The Wizard of Oz, this, yeah. th this mythos does not present the magical world as somewhere you have to get over the rainbow or through the magic wardrobe or down yeah. the rabbit hole or, you know, anything like that. This is right here. Yeah. Right now, there are we're looking. people all around, people, mundane people just don't notice them. They yeah. use the word muggles for what we say mundane, but, you know, yeah. but, you know, they're, you may pass them on the street, you know, down in some, some little place or hidden hollow or, or off the map place. They may be gathering, you know, they have their shopping places, you know, and all these things. Well, all this is true. Yeah. You see. It is. It is actually true. And, um, we don't have whole neighborhoods. Yeah. <laughs> And so the idea was, well, all these kids are going to go looking for this stuff. And, and, and it's out there. It's really out there. All you got to do is go into any, any uh, metaphysical shop and there'll be, a, you know, things posted on the bulletin board, you know. Yeah. Kids under 18 are not allowed to participate. You can't sign up and get your training. You can't go to the coven meetings and so on like that mm -hmm. unless you're over 18. That's the rule that everybody's made <clears throat> to avoid getting in trouble, which is reasonable. So what are they going to do? Because this thing is being presented to kids. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So we said, well, what can we do to help? And what we did was we make um, altar figurines. So we said, well, we'll make some altar figurines for kids then. Because this is the first thing you do when you set your foot on the magical path is you create an altar. Yep. That's, that's the first thing. Yeah. Got, so we should give the kids some magical altar figures. So we did. We created a nice little kid style god and goddess in the kind of Disney style. And, that, and then we went to the um, International New Age Trade Show in Denver, which we've been do, we've been doing for many years to sell our wares, yeah, our, 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 to market our statuary to stores, and we took these. And while we were there setting up, um, uh, Trish Telesco came by the booth, and she had just put out another book. I think the sixty fifth or something. She herself couldn't remember how many books she had written. <laughs> <laughs> she was there with her publisher. They brought her there to do book signings and presentations. And she said to me, I was congratulating her. She said, well, when are you going to write a book? And I said, well, you know, I'm too busy. I've got, 
I'm publishing a magazine. I've got this, all the stuff going on. I don't have time to write books. She said, let me introduce you to my publisher. So she took me over, sat me down and said to the publisher some very nice things about me. And uh, the publisher said, well, have a seat and tell us if you're going to write a book for us, what would it be? Well, I hadn't thought about this, yeah. but with all these ideas in mind, I'm thinking, well, you know, I like to write like a, a handbook for the apprentice wizard, you know, like the old, um, you know, junior woodchuck guide, you know, from the yeah. old Donald Duck comics or the, yeah. um, the Boy Scout handbook, you know, something would yeah. be your basic thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Everything you need to know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it would be with you forever for your whole life, you know. And I started spewing all this stuff just off the top of my head. She said, that sounds great. Send us a proposal. Oh, wow. Over the following month or so, I encountered several other reinforcements of the same idea with other people that just kind of came and reinforced this. And so by the time the third one came around, I knew the rule, you know, you get yeah. three of these, you know, you got to go with it. Yep, yep. So when the third one came, I said, all right, all right, I get the message. So I sat down, I wrote up a proposal, I sent it, I was accepted. I said, okay, now I've got to do this. <laughs> yep. Came up with the idea of a grimoire for the new generation. And I, I contacted all of the major um, <clears throat> movers and shakers, the leaders, the teachers, the group founders, the authors, of the, and the elders of the pagan yeah. community, and convened the Great Council, the, the legendary... Council of Mages and Sages that reverberates nice. throughout all of history and myth, you know. Yep. And so, um, and we did. Amazing bunch of people. And uh, the assignment was, let's create a, a grimoire for the next generation that is everything you wished you had had um, in your hands when you started yep. on the path. Yeah. And, everything, and the book that you want to get given to you at your coming of age ceremony in your next incarnation. Yeah. You know, that will carry you through. And everybody went, got it. Yeah. And working together, we created the Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard, which I think is a pretty cool book, actually. Yeah. And it's, got, it's been a bestseller and has been very popular and translated into a bunch of languages, which is how come we've ended up with students all over the world. Mm -hmm. And um, and I realized that as I was speaking together, this was a foundational textbook for a school yeah. that yet exist. Yeah. You know, I, I have this kind of a concept of my, my approach to life is sort of this Mission Impossible. I'm on Her Majesty's Sacred Service. So periodically, <laughs> you get these phone calls from the goddess, you know. Yep. They say, your next assignment, should you choose to accept it. <laughs> and, and you, know, you know how this works. You, you yeah, have to yeah, make it. Yeah. Because if you don't, they just cancel your show. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't want to watch you sitting on your ass. They want to They no. want to be with you doing something cool that they want. Mm -hmm. you got to yeah. assign yeah. So you, know, you never say, no, I think I'll pass on this one or... You don't even say, why me? You just go, okay, where do you want me to go? Yep. What do you want me to do? Yep. And, and then they give you the assignment and you give you everything you need to know. Well, the assignment was to create a school. Now, out of the, for which this book would be a foundational textbook. Cool. So I started talking to other people on the Great Council and, um, and we created a school. And we uh, incorporated on... Um, on Pi Day, on 314 of uh, 20, um, 2004, and uh, people flocked to get it together. We had website designers who showed up and said, what do you want this to look like? Because I didn't know anything about that stuff. Yeah. And on Lunasad of 2004, we opened our virtual doors, expecting a rush of teenagers. We did not anticipate a rush of mostly adults. Of yeah. Which there's consisted of maybe a quarter of people saying, I've been wanting this all my life. And now yeah. that it's available, I want in on it, you know? Yeah. And we're same response to the grimoire, the reviews of the grimoire, which were astonishingly positive. A good number of them were from adults saying, well, you know, I had to buy an extra copy for my grandkids so they won't keep taking mine. That kind <laughs> of <laughs> So, and then I would have uh, leaders of groups saying, well, we're using your book as a training manual for our coven or our group or our tradition. You know, our first language we got translated into was Romanian because the Romani wanted it. You oh, know, that's they so said cool. that their stuff had been oral tradition and they had lost so much. And this had all the stuff that they wanted to be able to pass on. So they wanted to translate it into Romanian, you know. Well, that's what happens when you when you put something out there. You you get people that you never would expect. So, so the gypsies yeah. reached out to you. Yeah, gypsies reached out to you and were like, exactly. 
Exactly. So yeah. we've got an amazing faculty of teachers and and they all started developing classes and we created a school with 16 departments, all color coded for different kinds of magic, you know, like green for wart cunning and red for alchemy and brown for beast mastery and, you know, the usual colors that we all know, but yeah. 16 of them that were all organized for departments and um, and and it it just took off. It yeah. just exploded and it's awesome and it's and it immediately went worldwide because we had tons of students in other countries where translations had been appearing like Brazil where we had you know one translation was a Portuguese so we got all these Brazilian students in China we got a bunch of students and other places like that and it's been a, a phenomenon that I'm very proud of because we yeah. have awesome teachers and even more awesome students because I still you know I, I still stay in there a lot, enough to you know, have one or two classes and great essays and things. So I kind of see the quality of our students coming through, but I can no longer teach, you know, as many classes as I did. Oh, yeah. So the grimoire is the required book for the first level. And then there's a companion that I wrote, which is required for the second level. And there's seven levels of the basic apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. And then you move into the journeyman program, which okay. takes you to another place of See, because the, the old guild system, of which our entire educational system is based, uh -huh. is is apprentice, journeyman, master, and adept. Oh, nice. Oh, that's so cool. So the job of the apprentice is to study and learn under the, the teachings of the masters. Yes. The, of the journeyman is to take those teachings out into the world and apply them in practice. Yeah. Life. That's what that means. Yeah, life. Yeah. And, the t and then... If you do that for a while, eventually people start showing up and saying, hey, I want you to teach me stuff. And then you move into the third stage as the master. And eventually, if you do that and you're a teacher and you as a, that's what the master's job is, is to teach. That's what the wizard's job is in all the stories, is to be the mentor of the next generation of young heroes. Yeah. That's the fundamental job of the wizard. Well, you're providing something that's so needed. Um, I, I think all of when I think of all the schools that are out there, Bella's school, your school, Don Lewis's school, and you guys all work together with things, and there's no competition, and and there shouldn't be. You guys really, you show how we should be with each other because all we all have the same goal. We want to teach. We want to to people who need it because. I know you come from a generation where that wasn't accessible. And now you're providing something to younger witches that is so accessible and it's it makes it not so hard to find. And I think all of you guys are doing such a great job with that. Well, with you guys, it seems it's community over ego, which yes. is a hard thing to find. Yeah. Because so many people have ego. I My craft is the right craft. Yeah. Your craft is subservient to mine because this is what I practice. And yeah, that's not right. Every, it's not. every person's path is their path, and that needs to be respected and honored. Yeah, and I, yeah, I love how you all work together, and and it's it's really nice. Well, a crucial attitude that we all share, and that I, that I emphasize a lot in the books, in the writings, in the teachings, is that ours is a path of service. We are here to serve, not to rule. I yeah. use the example of uh, Lucifer's choice in the Divine Comedy. You know, yeah. when you, I would rather rule in hell than to serve in heaven. Yes. You know? <laughs> We're not about that. We really aren't. You know, we're not yeah. about power over. We're not about rulership. We're here to serve, you know, as as we have been and hope to be. Um, receive service. We offer it as we have it available for what we can do. We've answered the calling. Yeah, it's a calling. We've answered the calling. It's a calling. Yes. And that's the crucial thing. So each of our schools has a different focus. Mm -hmm. The Gray School is unique because it's not a religious school. They're yeah. Completely non-denominational we have we have muslim jewish christian students all these traditions have their own mystical traditions yeah to go you know um and we have students from all of these traditions and they're all here in the same school to in communicating with each other yeah. you know honestly and openly and it's fabulous it's an awesome environment much like the ancient academies and mystery schools of old yep. which is what we're trying to do they weren't restricted to people who adhered to one particular faith they were a place where people could gather from everywhere, like Hypatia's school in Alexandria or yeah. mystery schools of all times. Well, so this well, is what we've tried to create. You're teaching magic, you know, and, and, and that's, that's, and anyone, if anyone wants to learn magic, they can be from whatever 
religious background or non-religious background that they want to be. And that's that's well, what's great about it. it. It was before it became villainized. It was the, the original concept of the Illuminati. Do not suppress information, to yes. express it and share it and see where, what it leads to. Yes. We are in the tradition of the Illuminati. We are... Um, and and I, I think this is great. I'm very proud of it. I'm I'm stunningly proud of, of the school. Actually, of all the work that I've done, I've created a number of, of things that have gone off with a life of their own. And I'm I'm really very proud of all my kids, as it were, yes. you know. Can I ask you? I notice you use the word wizard for the male witch and witch for the female witch. I, oh, I, no, no, I don't. I don't oh, make no, it, okay. Okay. No, either either of these words are really non gender. They okay, are. they're interchangeable. Okay, male and female witches are interchangeable. Wizardry, wizards means wisdom, means wise one. Yeah, you know, I'm just curious. The word has traditionally, in in times in history, although not so much in recent myth like like Harry Potter, but the word wizard is applied to men and women whose focus is being wise ones. That's the whole point. Okay. That's what the word means. I wanted to clear that up because I. I, obviously, I misheard, so I'm glad I cleared that up. So yeah, because we're all wizards, we're all witches, we're all magical. Exactly. Magic exactly. Yeah. Well, is it your is it your book about you and your wife called Witch and Wizard? Yes, it is yeah. because that was how we primarily identified ourselves. Yes. Yeah. You know, but we were both both. What do you, what do you think of the word warlock? Yeah, that's a tricky one. You know, <laughs> I, just, I, I I know people who call themselves warlocks yeah. and. Uh, and I have this conversation with them, you know. I know people who call themselves Satanists. And all of these are, in my experience, actually really good ethical people. Yes. But, uh, they identify with this terminology because of the sense of power that comes from it or the popular mythos, you know. Yeah. And I, I, I don't. And I, I don't really think that that's a good idea. But that they are wedded to this particular perceptions, you know, and that's how they want to be thought of. But warlock, of course, means traitor. In the old language, where logger twister of words in Norse. Oh, I didn't know that. I just word. knew that there was a kind of a negative yeah. connotation with the word warlock, and I, I we some people have come up and said, "Well, I'm a warlock," and and I and I have actually said, "Oh, well, we don't use that terminology. We we don't try to tell people what they should call themselves." Yeah, people call themselves whatever they, they want to. Call themselves you know? a frog prince for all I care, but I I think that knowing the history of where the word comes from. Well, it's very important. Well, warlock typically it, it implies you're dealing with the denizens of the lower plane. Yeah. And, and there's, I mean, what, what, if, to some people's mindset is they think that you're you're in demonology, you're working with dark spirits, so forth, and that's where the negative connotations come in because that's what was presented before. Yes, they were a warlock of the black magic, and, yeah, and as that, we, that all comes from from TV shows like, um, uh, you know, what is that series? The the three. Which is charmed, is it? Uh, charmed, yes. They they fought that, warlocks. Right. They use that in in a lot of popular myths too. But popular mythology, as revealed in TV shows and movies, is it's a very interesting thing. For example, throughout the '60s, we in America actually had no idea of uh, witchcraft in the way we understand it now at all. This was going on over in England, but the few witches, uh, Sybil Leake, um, Louise Schubner, Justine Glass, who wrote biographies, their autobiographies, yeah. all supported the popular mythos that witches were like a, a subspecies of humans, a separate species, like yeah. like, like fairies or elves or something. You I know? was going to say, yes, yes, like unicorns or something. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's different. That's another whole story. Yeah. Oh, but, I know but, your unicorn story, yeah. <laughs> but the idea was that this, this was not exactly human. Yeah, but the story, the mythos in, in I Married a Witch and Bewitched and Charmed and Bell, Book and Candle and all these things was the idea. And we still see it in virtually every TV show. Uh -huh. Witches are, are are not really exactly human. There's restrictions. They, they can't fall in love or they lose their power. They yeah. can't cry. They can, you know, make things happen by wiggling their nose or whatever it is, you know. And um, and, and people like Louise Hubner and Sybil Leake and Justine Glass said this was the case. They didn't present this as a religion or something that you could join or train in or that anybody could be a part of. It was all, well, this is passed down the bloodline of my family. You know, we had to inherit this. You know, you're a witch yeah. because your mother or your grandmother was a witch. And it, that's how it was presented. So... Uh, the pagan movement emerged and developed and became quite a significant movement in America during the 60s, long before the witches yeah. came in. And we had no idea. 
witches showed up in this in the 70s primarily because of um, Ray Buckland and Rosemary Buckland who brought Gardnerian yep. over. Yep. But it took them a while to get it popular. I visited them personally in um, uh, at their place in Long Island in um, 1971, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And it was quite an eye-opener, you Not know. Um, Susan Roberts had written her book, Witches USA. Oh, and, yeah. I, and we got it and was blown away. So we contacted her. And I was planning on going out to the East Coast anyway for the World Science Fiction Convention that year, which I have always done, which was in Boston. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. No, and you know, always. <laughs> and um, and so she, uh, we arranged for her to take us around and introduce us to all these people that she'd yeah. had in her book because they were all around the New York area. So yeah. I got people like Ray Buckland and and um, yeah. uh, and Leo Martello and all these other people, a whole bunch yeah. of. Them, all of whom are dead now, but they were. It was still an interesting experience, and um, and so they all, uh, all these different witches, started joining the uh, ecumenical council, the um, council of Themis that we had formed. It was the first pagan ecumenical council that we formed in 1969. You know, and initially it was well, actually, it grew to a couple dozen people, um, mostly pagan groups, of course, Greek and Egyptian and Norse and Church of All Worlds and Druids yeah. and all. These and things, you know, and then the witches came in, you know, and it really expanded it. And through the whole emergence of the pagan community, witches have been approximately half of the movement by all the surveys and statistics, just like the male female ratio has been slightly edged over to female, yep. you know, yeah. but not predominantly so, maybe like 55%. Yeah. You know, is that the leadership is primarily female, but not overwhelmingly, maybe 60%. And this is profound because this is there's not any other religion like that, you know. No, as those kind of figures. Well, I think when I when I think of sixties witchcraft. Now, I was born in seventy two, so I wasn't around in the sixties, but I did have an obsession with the movies like Rosemary's Baby and of course Bell Book and Candle, and um, and then there was the show I Married a Witch, and then of course Bewitched, and you know, so all that I, stuff, right? I love that stuff, and even though I know that it's a little exaggerated, and it's it, it opened the door. It opened the door, and I also see that it had to happen in the '60s that way because the '60s was such a, a time to like introduce open mind thinking, and and that yes. you know, and so why wouldn't it start in that way? Even if some of it was kind of silly or kind of you've got to give it credit it, it made it palatable to the average american yes and that's okay you know i hear from a lot of people today who are really you know really serious witches and stuff like that and they want to know well what do you think about all these you know fluffy bunny people who don't really know anything they've read silver raven wolf or something like that yeah. or, See, that's really okay. It just simply broadens the base here. How many Christians are there out there who consider themselves Christians? They've never read a word of the Bible. They never go to church. They just identify somehow with the culture and mythos. Yeah. It's okay because you don't expect everybody to be clergy. You don't expect everybody to be a serious practitioner. If you're talking about a religion, it's not the same as a secret society or a cult or, or an order. You know, yeah. people can join that level if they want to. If they feel the calling, they can go on to go deeper. But in the Church of All Worlds, we have a concept of nine concentric circles from the outer to the inner identified with the, the planets, yeah. you know, of which the first and most outer, which we initially identified as Pluto, now represents the Oort cloud, which is like lots and lots of people out there on the edge. And that's just your edge, you know, but you yeah, move in. Did you, you get idea for Church of All Worlds from that book? What was that book yes. called? The book was Stranger in a Strange Land. Yes. Yeah. Now we've got a few minutes You're, left before so we're at the top. Of, yeah. And, we well, Stranger in a Strange Land was the Bible, really, of the of that era. It was profound. Yeah. It had a huge impact. And it came out yeah. in um, 1961. And it was the world's, uh, it was the Science Fiction Book Club Book of the Month for October of that year. And it was the culmination of... Um, 12 preceding books that Robert Heinlein had written every year during the 50s that were the Harry Potter books of that time. Yeah. They, were, they were about young people, teenagers, 
and they weren't all the same character, but each one was like a year older, you know, you kind yeah. of moved through it. Well, I picked up on those when I was at the starting age, like if you started off on the Harry Potter book when you're 11, you know, and then every year you're the next year yeah. older. So you the with it. Yeah. So I grew up on those. That was my that was my teaching of that period. And they were profound books. And like all serious books of this nature, they're all about what does it mean to be fully human? And only science fiction can present that in an effective way because it can present and as, as opposed to what? What is the alternative? What does it mean to be human? They were very profound. And finally, um, after the series was completed for kids and I'd gone all the way through high school in the 50s, which was just like the movies and TV shows of high school in the 50s, Pleasantville, you know, that was my, I grew up in Pleasantville. <laughs> It was just like that. You saw it in color, though, just like they did. <laughs> the color when it got into the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> well, it ended up being the color. The technicolor, yeah. Then we ate these little tablets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so at that point, Strange in a Strange Land came out. And that was the first time that concepts of sex and religion and relationships had been dealt with in science fiction was in that book, and it was profound. It had enormous impact, especially for a first generation of people who were just discovering sex and drugs. Yeah. And yes, and, and so, and, and is that where, so you started the Church of All Worlds, is that correct? That's and when right. did that start? Well, the, um, in the book, the, uh, there is this church created called the Church of All Worlds that yeah. is created to try to convey these Martian teachings that have been acquired by the hero who was who was the only uh, unborn survivor of the first failed mission to Mars, you know, and he's raised by Martians who had no idea about humanity, and they raise him in their culture the way we raise a chimpanzee, you know, mm -hmm. in our culture. And then 25 years later, another successful expedition from Earth goes, finds him, and brings him back to Earth, you know, and the stuff that he has learned then becomes the basis of what eventually emerges as a whole new religion that he incorporates as the Church of All Worlds. And the book describes how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and we said, wow, let's do this, you know. Awesome. Well, the central right of the whole thing is a right of water sharing, where you recognize that the universality of water unites us all. And the, the ritual sharing of water is a, is, is a way of affirming that we all, in fact, share that same universal essence, because water is universal. Yes. Uh, all the universe, all the water on Earth has come from space, and yeah. it's all from the stars and galaxies. It's it's primordial, you know. So that when you share water ritually, you are affirming that that kinship, that universality. And so, after reading the book uh, over our respectively over Christmas and spring vacations, my the first friend that I discovered in high school, who was the first other person like me, you yeah. know, that I had discovered because I grew up, you know thinking I was the only weirdo mutant there was, you know, like me, yeah. and like many of us did. We were oh, yeah. changelings, you know, we were <laughs> mutants, you know. That's why we relate to things like the X-Men and stuff like that, you know. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. That, and Harry Potter and all these stories, you know. You know, you you must have been born. I used to go in the backyard with a flashlight to signal the flying saucers to come no, and take, take me home. Yeah, take me home, right, do exactly. Watch, do you we, watch... We, Big Bang Theory with Sheldon? Yes, yes. You were that. Sheldon. Yes, exactly. I was Sheldon. I, was totally <laughs> Sheldon. I, I totally relate to that. Yes, yes, exactly. So, and in fact, that's what's a wonderful thing in the pagan community. So many people come in with that same experience. Mm -hmm. They say, wow, I was always felt alone and weird. I always was into this stuff. I always believed these things, but I thought I was all alone. And now I see I'm not alone. There are others. I feel like I've come home. You yeah. found home, and, and that's how we've got to be always here. Right? And we get, we always do. Yeah. And we get to say those beautiful words, welcome that's home. Welcome yeah. home. Welcome home. And now every pagan festival has a big sign over the entry that says, welcome home. Because that's what it's people. about. That's our people. We're finding our people. And a, what a wonderful feeling. And I was the first yes. there to do that, you know? I was the first person to claim pagan as an identity for myself yeah. and religion. So every other person, it was like, hey, I'm a pagan. I think you're a pagan, too. Let's be yeah. pagans together. Let's and be pagans it together. It well, 
clink and drink to be in misfits and pagans and, and science fiction junkies and comic book nerds and scary movie watchers. And I mean, we all, we all do that. Well, on April 7th of 1962, my friend Lance and I, after having both read the book and talked about this a lot over many months, we sat down together and, and opened a canteen and shared water for the first time. And that began the entire process. You know, from that, we started reaching out to other people. We'd turn people that we'd meet that were really cool onto Stranger to Strange Land, and they would read it. They'd come back, wow, that's really awesome. We'd say, yeah. Um, we're doing it. We're doing yeah. it, yeah. Never well, that, you know, I, we could talk. We could do a two-hour show, but we have we have what, viewers that have ADD. So <laughs> we got to keep it at an hour. But okay. I would love to have you back over on and talk about more things because you are just so interesting and yeah. full of so many things. I, I I really thank you so much for being a guest on our show. Is there anything you want to say before we, we end our show? Any? Well, I, I hope that your viewers will check out the various websites I've got. The school, yep. the great school of wizardry, the church yep. of all worlds. It's claw.org, very simple. All mm -hmm. Just look them up. They're all easy. They all got websites. My personal website Oberon Zell, the 2020 website. Yep. You know, there's cool stuff out there, and I would love to reach out to everybody and, and all do this together because that's what we're here for. I'm going to put all the links in the description because this will we upload this to our YouTube uh, channel. And so yep. in the description, I'll put all the links. And, of course, I will let you know so you can watch. And uh, well, when you, well, when you get here in Washington, you have to reach out to us, and maybe we'll have you come visit us here in Spokane. Yeah. We, we would can, love to host you. Yeah, we would love to have you be in our home. and Hopefully we'll get past this here uh, quarantine. Once it goes back to closer to normal. Yeah, right? when we get to normal again. <laughs> Whatever that's going to look like. Whatever normal is. Well, it to may take a normal change, but when we're able to intermingle again. When we're able to reach out and actually touch someone. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. All righty, guys. Um, well, um, before oops. we go, we we like to tell our um, our viewers if there's any questions that you have or um, you want to be a guest on our show, please email us at crossroadscoven at gmail .com. What was that email address again? That's crossroadscoven at gmail .com. So remember, everyone, always walk with the goddess, be kind to one another, and until next time, blessed be. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Oberon. Clink and drink to Oberon Zell, everybody. Oberon Zell. Oberon Zell. All right. And...